Good evening, everyone, and very warm welcome to the virtual Einstein Forum for what is the last event on this program. We will restart in April. Uh, but before that, I'm very, very happy and glad to be able to welcome Patrick Svensson uh, from Malmö, Sweden, uh, who is or has been a journalist who was mainly writing about the arts, culture and science, um, but he's now a very successful author. And that's why he's here, because he's written a wonderful book, uh, The Gospel of the Eels. It has come out in German under the title Das Evangelium der Aale. And we would like to talk about this in conversation with a little bit of reading tonight. Welcome, Patrick. Thank you very much for having me. It's very nice to finally talk to you. Yes, we had this event planned for June last year, but we were uh, prevented from, from meeting in person by the first wave of the corona pandemic. Uh, unfortunately, the second wave also uh, prevented us from meeting, but one of these days we might just, Patrick. I yeah. hope so. Let's start with a reading about the peculiar life cycle and the pattern of migration of this most enigmatic of fishes, the eel. Would you like to enlighten us with reading from your book from chapter one? I will show a few pictures along the way so that you can uh, get an impression of what Patrick is talking about. Patrick, of course. take it away. Oh, here it goes. The eel. This is how the birth of the eel comes about. It takes place in a region of the Northwest Atlantic Ocean called the Sagasso Sea, a place that is in every respect suitable for the creation of eels. The Sagasso Sea is actually less a clearly defined body of water than a sea within a sea. Where it starts and where it ends is difficult to determine since it eludes the usual measures of the world. It's located slightly northeast of Cuba and the Bahamas, east of the North American coast, but it is also a place in flux. The Sargasso Sea is like a dream. You can rarely pinpoint the moment you enter or exit. All you know is that you have been there. This impermanence is a result of the Sargassos being a sea without land borders. It is bounded instead by four mighty ocean currents. In the west by the life-giving Gulf Stream. In the north by its extension, the North Atlantic Drift. In the east by the Canary Current. And in the south by the North Equatorial Current. 2 million square miles in size. The Sagasso Sea swirls like a slow, warm eddy inside this closed circle of currents. What gets in doesn't always have an easy time getting out. The water is deep blue and clear in places very nearly 23,000 feet deep. And the surface is carpeted with a vast fields of sticky brown alga called sargassum, which gives the sea its name. Drifts of seaweed many thousands of feet across blanket the surface, providing nourishment and shelter for a myriad of creatures, tiny invertebrates, fish and jellyfish, turtles, shrimp, and crabs. Farther down in the deep, other kinds of seaweed and plants thrive. Life teems in the dark, like a nocturnal forest. This is where the European eel, Anguilla anguilla, is born. This is where mature eels breed in the spring and their eggs are laid and fertilized. Here, safe in the darkness of the depths, small larva-like creatures with disturbingly tiny heads and poorly developed eyes spring to life. They're called leptocephalus larva and have a body like a willow leaf, 
flat and virtually transparent, only a few millimeters long. This is the first stage of the eel's life cycle. The gossamer willow leaves immediately set off on their journey, swept up by the Gulf Stream. They drift thousands of miles across the Atlantic toward the co coast of Europe. It's a journey that can take as long as three years. And during this time, each larva slowly grows millimeter by millimeter, like a gradually inflating balloon. And when at least it reaches Europe, it undergoes its first metamorphosis, transforming into a glass eel. This is the second stage of the eel's life cycle. Glass eels are, much like their willow leaf former selves, almost entirely transparent, two to three inches in length, elongated and slithery, transparent, as though neither color nor sin has yet to take root in their bodies. They look, in the words of the marine biologist Rachel Carson, like thin glass rods shorter than a finger. Frail and seemingly defenseless, they are considered a delicacy by, among other people, the Basques. When a glass eel reaches the coasts of Europe, it will usually travel up a brook or river, adapting almost instantly to a freshwater existence. This is where it undergoes yet another metamorphosis, turning into a yellow eel. Its body grows serpentine and muscular. Its eyes remain relatively small with a distinctive dark center. Its jaws becomes wide and powerful. Its gills are small and almost completely concealed. Thin, soft fins stretch along the entirety of its back and belly. Its skin finally develops pigment, coloring its shades of brown, yellow, and gray. And it becomes covered in scales so tiny they can be neither seen nor felt, like an imaginary armor. If the glass eel is tender and fragile, the yellow eel is strong and sturdy. This is the third stage of the eel's life cycle. The yellow eel is able to move through the shallowest, most overgrown waters, as well as the swiftest currents. It can swim, swim through murky lakes and up tranquil streams, up wild rivers and through lukewarm ponds. When needed, it can pass through swamps and ditches. It doesn't let circumstance stand in its way. And when all aquatic possibilities have been exhausted, it can take to dry land, slithering through moist brush and grass in pushes toward new waters that can last for hours. The eel is, thus, a fish that transcends the piscine condition. Perhaps it doesn't even realize it's a fish. It can migrate thousands of miles, unflagging and undaunted, before it suddenly decides it's found a home. It doesn't require much of this home. The, the environs are something to adapt to, to endure and get to know. A muddy stream or lake bed, preferable with some rocks and hollows to hide in and enough food. Once it has found its home, it stays there year after year and normally wanders within a radius of only a few hundred yards. If relocated by external forces, it will return as quickly as it can to its chosen abode. Eels caught by researchers, tagged with radio transmitters and released many miles from their point of capture, have been known to return to where they first found within a week or two. No one knows exac exactly how they find their way. The yellow eel is a solitary creature, it usually lives out the active phase of its life alone, letting the passing season, seasons dictate uh, its activities. When the temperature uh, drops, 
It can lie motionless in the mud for long periods, utterly passive, and at times entangled with other eels, like a messy ball of yarn. It's a nocturnal hunter. At dusk, it emerges from the sediment and starts looking for food, eating whatever it can find. Worms, larvae, frogs, snails, insects, crayfish, fish, as well as mice and baby birds when given the chance. It is not above scavenging. In this way, the eel lives out the greater part of its life in a brownish yellow grease, alternating between activity and hibernation, seemingly lacking any sense of purpose other than its daily search for food and shelter. As though life was first and foremost about waiting and its meaning found in the gaps or in the abstract future that can't be brought about by any means other than patience. And it's a long life. An eel that successfully avoids illness and calamity can live, can live for up to 50 years in one place. There are Swedish eels who have made it past 80 in captivity. Myths and legends tells of eels living to 100 or more. When an eel is denied a way to achieve its main purpose in life, procreation, it seems able to live forever, as though it could wait until the end of time. But at some point in its life, usually after 15 to 30 years, a wild eel will suddenly decide to reproduce. What triggers this decision, we may never know, but once it has been made, the eel tranquil existence ends abruptly and its life takes on a different character. It starts making its way back to the sea while undergoing its final metamorphosis, the drab and indeterminate yellowish brown of its skin disappears. Its coloring grows clearer and more distinct. Its back turns black and its sides silver, marked with stripes, as though its entire body changes to reflect its now newfound determination. The yellow eel becomes a silver eel. This is the fourth stage of the eel's life cycle. When autumn rolls out its protective darkness, the silver eel wander back out into the Atlantic and set off toward the Sargasso Sea. And as though through deliberate choice, the eel's body adapts to the conditions of the journey. Only now do its reproductive organs develop. Its fins grow longer and more powerful to help uh, propel it. Its eyes grow larger and turn blue to help it see better in the depths of the ocean. Its digestive system shuts it down. Its stomach dissolves. From now on, all the energy it needs will be taken from existing fat reserves. Its body fills with roe or milt. No external interference can distract the eel from its goal. It swims at as much as 30 miles a day, sometimes as deep as 3000 feet below the surface. We still know very little about this journey. It may take the trip in six months or it may stop for winter. It has been shown that a silver eel in captivity can live for up to four years without any nourishment at all. It's a long ascetic journey undertaken with an existential resolve that cannot be explained. But once an eel reaches the Sargasso Sea, it has once again found its way home. On the swirling blankets of seaweed, its eggs are fertilized. And with that, the eel is done, its story complete, and it dies. Thank you very much, Patrick, for this first insight in this peculiar animal. And it's not only a peculiar life cycle we're talking about, it's also an enigmatic one. 
because at least for a long, long period of time, the, these four stages, these four metamorphoses you talked about were not known, or at least they were not connected to one another. No one knew that this was the very same species. And in your book, you spend a long time writing about uh, what you call the eel question. And I have to say, um, I have to admit, not being an expert on the subject, that I never knew there was such a thing as the eel question. But apparently, it has a more than 2,000 year history that people wondered about the eel, and in particular, wondered about the reproduction of the eel, because uh, I, since these four stages were not connected, no one connected the dots, no one knew where they're breeding. And as you said and um, informed us, the reproductive organs of the silver eel, the last stage in the life of the eel, um, only develop on the way to the Sargasso Sea. So uh, if you catch an eel in, in the fresh waters around Berlin or in Sweden or wherever, you will not be able to find reproductive organs. And that is something that has um, triggered the great excitement and interest of a great number of people, men and women, I might say, um, starting off with no, uh, none other than Aristotle. Um, and you run through a whole cast of characters who were intrigued by this question. Can you enlighten us a little bit more about it? How this eel question led people to be obsessed about science in this way? Yes, I was actually surprised myself while doing the research that the, of the time and the effort that people have put into trying to understand the eel and, and that there actually is uh, this uh, there actually is an eel question in, in natural science that's been around for hundreds of years and this eel question means that this is a problem that is specifically hard to solve it, basically, it's been very hard to understand the eel. It, it's, as you say, it has it's two, two, uh, two reasons mainly. First of all, the metamorphosis, the different life uh, stages it goes through. It, for a long time, of course, the scientists believed that those different uh, stages were different species. They didn't, didn't think that the small larva, the first stage, was the same an animal as the yellow eel or silver eel. And the second uh, uh, reason has to, of course, to do with uh, reproduction. How does the eel breed? When you study, catch an eel in Europe and study it and look for the, uh, the se sexual organs, you won't find any because it doesn't um, develop them until they're on the way to the Sagasso Sea. And this was for a very long time, a quite a big thing in the, the world of natural science. And it started, as you say, say with Aristotle. He studied a lot of, um, uh, did a lot of studies on, the, studies on the natural world. And he was seemed to be uh, especially interested in, in the eel. If you read his big uh, uh, work, the, the, the history of animals, he write a lot about eels there. And, of course, well, he studied them. He tried to find the sexual organs and, and he didn't find any. And he came to the conclusion that the eel doesn't reproduce. Unlike most other animals and fishes, it, it uh, doesn't uh, reproduce at all. It becomes, it comes to life out of nothing. Life that it come, that suddenly uh, start without no uh, reproduction. He said that eel uh, is born uh, as a small larva out of the mud at, at the bottom of uh, seas and rivers. And this uh, um, conclusion actually lived on for into modern times almost. We, we have to go to the 1800, uh, the 19th century before scientists at, at last could actually prove that the eel had sexual differences and that it had reproductive organs and that it actually breeds uh, just like other fish do. This Aristotelian idea of, let's say, 
spontaneous generation out of mud or whatever, yeah. um, that must have traveled really well over the centuries because it, it seems to me, and, and you alluded to this in the book as well, that is somewhat akin to religious beliefs about divine creation. It's creating something out of nothing. Suddenly yeah. something is there yeah. before there was nothing, uh, yeah. which, which is weird. But let me get to another one of those um, silent heroes of your book. Um, it's one in a long line of scientists um, who were pretty concerned about the eel question. And it's a surprising character. We all know him. It's Sigmund Freud. And perhaps you can tell us a little bit about good old Sigmund's time in Trieste and um, what he did before he got into psychoanalysis. Yeah, that's one of the, when I, when I was uh, writing this, the, 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 to a, a big, a large d degree, it's a book about um, the history of natural science. And, and I found out that, that um, uh, if um, the, the important question was, wasn't what do we know about the eel, but I also had to ask, how do we know the things we know about the eel? And that's when you find all these stories and you find all these characters. And, and you find the story about Aristotle studying eels. And, and then you found, uh, find uh, Sigmund Freud. And it, quite surprisingly, but, but uh, it, it also is a, a great story, I think. Uh, Sigmund Freud, when he was 19 year old, he was a, a student of uh, uh, biology amongst other things. And he had, like, he had plans of maybe going into the natural sciences. And he became aware of this eel question that had bothered scientists all, uh, all the way since um, Aristotle. And he, uh, he, he was going to try to solve this question. And the, the question for him was, how do they reproduce? Do the eel have sexual differences? Are they male and are they females? No one really knew that. Then suddenly a, 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 a scientist, uh, um, someone find, found a um, female eel with, with sexual organs. And then it was, the, the question was to find a male eel with sexual organs to, to really prove that there was both male and females. So Sigmund Freud, he went to Trieste uh, in what is uh, today uh, Italy, and uh, he was gonna find a male eel with sexual organs, or as he uh, himself, uh, describe it he was going to find an eel testicle and he spent about a month in uh, Trieste studying eels every morning he went down to the harbor got a big basket full of uh, eels freshly caught in the Mediterranean and then he, he went to his laboratorium and he uh, was there all day cutting up eels looking for this eel testicle he, he studied more than 400 eels and didn't, of course, didn't find one single small eel testicle and had to write a, a, a disappointing report about uh, not being able to, able to solve this old mystery and that the uh, eel question was uh, still there. And of course, you have to at least think that it may have affected his later, later career, that he left natural science and went into the, the human psyche instead, and maybe because the, the, the human is, is easier to understand than the eel. And also this is, this is the man that, that had later would delve deeper into the human mind and into human sexuality than, than anyone before him. This is the man who, who uh, wrote about the, the the theory is about castration complex and about penis envy. And you have to imagine that this was the man who started his scientific career trying to explain the sexuality in a fish, actually trying to find the male sexual organ in a fish uh, uh, and failed. Um, that makes you wonder if psychoanalysts today 
do appreciate the great contribution made to their profession by the eel. But never mind, let's get to the stage where um, now, I guess it was somewhere in, sometime in the 19th century that at least the uh, someone connected the dots and realized that those four uh, stages in the life cycle of the eel are in fact the same animal, um, which didn't do much to solve the mystery of the eel. It merely shifted the ground because the question became a different one. And that was, where do they breed? If these willow leaves that come floating across the currents into the European waters, turn into the glass eel, then the yellow eel, and then back into the a silver eel that travels back, but where do they travel to? And to find this out, uh, we have a great and very persistent, you could even say a stubborn marine biologist, a Dane uh, named Johannes Schmidt. Tell us a little bit about Johannes Schmidt, which seems to me at least to be an outstanding character when it comes to persistence in the search for the breeding ground of the eel. Yes, uh, Johannes Schmidt was a Dan Danish uh, a brilliant young scientist uh, around the year of 1900. A lot of things had been happening in, in eel science uh, the decades before, after Sigmund Freud's failure. They actually managed to find a, a, a male eel with sexual organs and they could prove that the, the eel reproduces just like any other animal. And they found out that uh, these different metamorphoses, that the different stages, uh, they were all um, uh, the, same, the same species. But still, there was a big uh, mystery left. And uh, there was a, there was a, a famous uh, natural scientist just ar around the year uh, 1900 that uh, gave a speech where he said that now the natural sciences have solved every question in the world except the eel question. Like, like now we know everything except how, how the eel uh, uh, functions. And the big question at this time was where does the eel reproduce? Because they knew that the, the silver eel goes out to the ocean and it disappears and they knew that it didn't come back. They also knew that, that every spring these small eel larvas come to the European coasts, but where do they come from? Where does the eel breed? So this Danish Johannes Schmidt, he was going to uh, answer this question and he had a, a method. He would go out in the ocean on a small boat and he would catch those small larvae, these willow leaf uh, like larvas, and he would measure them. And when he found a place where they were the smallest, that actually has to be the, the birthplace of the eel. The only problem with his method is that the, 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 these uh, eel larvas is very small and the Atlantic Ocean is very big. So he started uh, sailing around the European coast for seven years. He, he went, uh, went, uh, went on the ocean in 1904 and until 1911, he, he just sailed around from uh, uh, at the European coast and he catched a lot of uh, larvas, but they were uh, all quite big. So he understood that he have to, um, after seven years, he understood that he have to go further out to sea, further west on the Atlantic Ocean. And when he did this, he, he, he uh, actually, he saw that the larvas were getting smaller. For every mile west he came, the, uh, the eel larva was smaller. Then of course, there was the, the world war that, uh, that made it very difficult for him to continue his studies and he had to, stay uh, in Copenhagen for a couple of years. But as soon as the war has ended, he was out there again, catching small larvas on the Atlantic Ocean. And he spent almost 20 years, 18 years in that boat out on the Atlantic Ocean, catching small larvas and measuring them until he found a place where they, they were just a couple of millimeters uh, long, these larvas, and he could put a mark on the on the um, map and say that this is where it happens. They, this is where all uh, eels are born. 
uh, and this was in the Sargasso Sea. And the, the amazing thing about that story too is that the only thing that Johannes Schmidt found in, in the um, Sargasso Sea was these small newly born larvas. And this also tells you something about how science works and how knowledge is produced. When we say that we know that all eels are born in the Sargasso Sea, it's because of Johannes Schmidt and his studies. But the fact is that he never even saw any uh, mature eels in the Sargasso Sea. He never saw them breeding. And still today, no, no, no one has ever seen eels breed and they won't do it in captivity. And the fact is also that no, uh, no, no one has even today even seen an, a, an eel in the Sargasso Sea, just those small larvas. No one has seen a mature eel in the Sargasso Sea, live or dead. And that's, that, make, that makes it almost philosophical, I, I think, but about how knowledge is produced and, and, uh, and uh, how, how, how we actually know the things we do. And, where is where exactly is the the line between knowledge and and the, what you would call faith? I'm sure we'll come back to that in a little while. But, but before we do so, I'd like to draw attention to the fact that you are quite right mm -hmm. that uh, large parts of your book uh, could be seen as a history of science. On the other hand, you also deliver what is perhaps a cultural history of the eel, in as much as you look at literature. And I wonder how did the eel get its bad reputation there? It is seen as slimy, ugly, unsavory, or even detestable. Um, and in discussing that, you go through the Holy Scriptures and a lot of literature from the tin drum to um, uh, Schaum der Tage, what is it called in English? Um, okay. Which one? The, the, the form of things. It's, um, ah, I don't get it anymore. To Graham Swift's Waterland. Yeah. It comes back to me in a minute. Yeah. Could you lead us a little bit through this literary history of the eel, how he, the eel crops up everywhere and he's not always a savory character? No, the, I, I wouldn't say that the eel has a, plays a big part in uh, literary history, but uh, when it shows up in, in, in literature or in the arts, uh, it's often as something quite, as quite scary figure. Uh, I think it's often as a symbol of something unconscious and uh, something that dwells underneath and, and that we know, know is there, but doesn't necessarily want to 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 see and i think uh, this um, bad reputation that the eel has uh, it has a long traditions because people thought that uh, eels were eat eat were eating people eat, eating dead people and uh, and uh, uh, but in modern times i think actually that uh, Günther Grass has a <laughs> A big it plays a big part in this bad reputation yeah. for the eel, because everyone that has uh, read the Tin Drum or or seen the movie remembers this scene with the the, the horse's head and the, the eels. And the, when I talk to people, even in Sweden, a lot of people bring this scene up with again to us. And the in it, and the eel is actually playing a. a, a, a quite an uh, important uh, role in, in the tin drum. And, and I would say just, uh, as I said, as a symbol for, for, for the unconscious, I think. And you reconnected with Sigmund Freud in this context with the uncanny, yeah. um, but that's that aside, the reputation of the eel is quite different in nature writing, just like yourself. There are many who are fascinated with the eel's life cycle, and in particular with the mystery of reproduction. <clears throat> and in many cases that overrides this uncanniness of the eel. And your hero, it seems to me, in this context is Rachel Carson. 
uh, with her book, um, Under the Sea Wind, a famous zoologist, author, and pioneer of the environmentalist movement. And she, as far as your quotes tell us, positively embraces the mystery of the eel, this open question. Uh, and it, she uses a very poetic language whenever she strays from the established scientific facts, which comes back to your philosophical point about where does our, lang uh, uh, does our knowledge actually stop being certain and where does it require faith? Um, and she gets around this by using anthropomorphism. She actually names the heel, um, and it's a she, and she explores her thoughts and feeling of this eel named Aguila. It's a fable of sorts. Um, and that leads me to a question regarding your own approach to nature writing. Um, and here, my impression as a reader was that you're somewhat torn. Um, again, it concerns as many other parts of the books, what you might call the limits of knowledge. On the one hand, you call yourself an empiricist. Um, mm. and you cite approvingly Thomas Nagel's answer to this famous question, what it is like to be a bat, and put simply, we cannot know the answer to this question. We cannot know what it is like to be a bat. We cannot know the consciousness of another human being. Then how does one, how do you take the perspective of the eel? It seems to me that anthropomorphism seems unavoidable. Um, yeah. In particular, when it comes to the last metamorphosis, I mean, you then ask, when, how, and why does the eel decide, let alone the word decide, mm. to turn into a silver eel and reproduce and yeah. go out to sea? What does the eel feel? A longing to return to its origin? Like Rachel Carson's Anguilla? Are you not anthropomorphizing yourself? I may be, I may be, a little bit at least, but I, I find that very interesting. I, I, when I wrote the book, I had a, I struggled with this because uh, um, that, that's, a, that's, a mis that's a mystery. When does the silver eel decide to, decide to go back to the Sargasso Sea? Because uh, when you study them, you can see that some, some uh, eels, uh, uh, becomes silver eels and it, uh, goes to the Sagasso Sea when they are like six or seven years old. Other eels do it when they are 50 or more years old. What, what is it that triggers this metamorphosis? But when I use words like the eel longing to the Sagasso Sea or deciding to go, I, my inspiration really was Rachel Carson because I, I, I was struggling with this, but then I, when I read her, especially her first book, Under the Sea Wind, that, where she writes about eels, I understood that I, I truly believe that it's possible to write and be totally scientifically uh, accurate and, and correct, and but still use um, maybe tools or methods that are more, more associated with um, literature or art. And what uh, Rachel Carson does, she, she, she gives the animal human emotions and human experiences and uses human concepts. And she actually dis uh, uh, explained this in a, in a letter she wrote about her first book that when she said that she, for example, she wrote about the eel being scared. And she said, I understand that it, the eel doesn't experience fear in the same way as a human being uh, does. For, for the fish, it's mainly physical. For the human being, it's mainly uh, psychological. But she says, if we want to really uh, understand the behavior of the animal, we have to use the world, words that come from the, the, the human experience and the human concepts. And, and I believe that the, that's, you can do that without losing the scientific perspective. And I believe that it, in some ways, I think you actually can enhance, increase the scientific understanding of the natural world by you uh, describing it with our own human concepts and experiences. Maybe we have nothing else to go by, 
actually. Um, oh. what, when it comes to, I mean, even the scientific method relies on assumption and has to compensate for blind spots. Not all has been observed with regard to the eel. A mystery remains. Yeah. You have to recount that in some way. So there's, I guess, a residual element of belief involved. Um, however you want to phrase this, this has to be I some belief. But um, what struck me is that we have countless scientists pursuing this quest with such determination. I mean, take again, Johanna Schmidt traveling almost two decades on the open sea in search of ever smaller willow lava. Um, mysteries, of course, always in, entice and, and, and uh, are motivating in a sense for the scientific yeah. mind. Mm. Uh, but you still, in your book, you speculated a little bit about a possible answer why Johannes Schmidt was so determined to find the smallest willow leaf ever and to locate the spot where the, where the eel procreates. Um, and your speculation is bordering on the metaphysical because you get to the point where you ask a person seeking the origin of something is also seeking his own origin. Yeah. That's a speculation you voice with regard to Johannes Schmidt. Um, <laughs> eternal questions, if you like. The search for oneself. Who am I? Where do I come from? Where am I going? And that, now this is a big turnaround. Uh, now that leads me to a feature of your book which we haven't discussed at all. It's the personal dimension, the story of your family, and in particular, the story of your relationship with your father, which also revolves around the eel, with father and son fishing together. But here too, we find on more than one occasion references to both the precarious nature of knowledge. Are my childhood memories correct? Are they accurate? Did my father really go fishing when he was young? as well as to the eternal question of origin just mentioned, that plays a part in the relationship with your father as well. Who am I? Where do I come from? Where am I going? But these questions not only relate to your father's life, first and foremost, they relate to your father's life, but also to your own life, don't they? Yes. Yeah. And I, I think that when, uh, when, um studying the natural world, I think there's a part of it that always has been about finding your own place uh, in this world. And one, one thing I uh, discovered when uh, studying um, the natural science history was that a lot of the people that are, are central characters in, the, in this uh, story of the eel uh, science actually uh, have been parentless. They lost their parents at an early age, one of them or both of them. That's uh, regards to Aristotle and, and, uh, and Johanna Schmidt and Rachel Carson. And I wanted to write, to, I wanted to write about my own experiences of, of the eel as a way to get closer to the subject. And, and when I wrote about that, I, I I had to write about the, the, the uh, summer evenings I spent with my, my dad fishing for eels through uh, all of my childhood. Um, we, we fished together, always just me and him, uh, late summer, night, uh, summer nights down by a small river. And uh, these, these nights become, became very important to us. It brought us together and, and connected us in a way and kept us together. So, the eel actually played a, a, a important part in my relationship with my father. And this would, when, when writing in these two different stories, the stories about me and my father and my, my childhood and our relationship. And uh, on the other hand, the scientific story about the eel and the cultural history and the, the biology and everything. After a while, like they started to like reflect each other, these two different stories, and and maybe not fully intentionally, they uh, they um, 
became like a mirror of for each other and the the book the story also become became a story about trying to find my own origin trying to find my own sargasso sea trying to understand how who my father was and and what we had in common and what separated us and where i where i actually come from and what made me the one i am today and this um, I think the the, the story is the, the eels migration to the Sagasso Sea and this uh, the fact that the eel just only can reproduce in the Sagasso Sea that it has to go back to its origin it has to find its way back home at some point in life it it started something in my own mi mind and my own memories of uh, my childhood and thinking about my own life that I think a lot of people get this urge at some point in their life to to go back to where they came from. Maybe just in the mind, but you have to, to understand better where where you came from and and what made you the one you are. So 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 they, they became reflections of each other, different stories, but weirdly it tied together. Would that be an appropriate time to give us a taste of this by reading from the second chapter, just a short passage so that we get an impression of how this relationship connected between you and your father um, on the riverbanks? Yes, sure. It's just the first uh, small chapter about my, my, me and my father fishing for eels. My father taught me to fish for eel in the stream bordering the fields of his childhood home. We drove down at dusk in August, taking a left of the main road to cross the stream, stream and turning onto a small road that was little more than a tractor path in the dirt, winding down a steep slope and then moving parallel with the water. On our left were the fields, the golden wheat brushing against the side of a car. On our right, the quietly hissing grass. Beyond it, the water. Around 20 feet wide, a tranquil stream meandering through the green greenery like a silver chain, glinting in the last slanted rays of the setting sun. We drove slowly along the rapids where the stream rushed in a startled fashion between the rocks and passed the twisted old willow tree. I was seven years old and had already gone down this same road many times before. When the tracks ended in a wall of impenetrable vegetation, dad turned off the engine and everything went dark and still, aside from the murmur of the stream. We were both wearing wellies and greasy vinyl vaders, mine yellow and his orange. And we took two black buckets full of fishing gear, a flashlight and a jar of worms from the trunk and set up. Along the bank of the stream, the grass was wet and impenetrable and taller than me. Dad took the lead, forging a path the vegetation closed like an arc above me as I, as I followed. Bats flitted back and forth above the stream, silent like black punctuation marks against the sky. After 40 yards, Dad stopped and looked around. This'll do, he said. The bank was steep and muddy. If you missed your step, you ran the risk of falling over and sliding straight into the water. Twilight was already falling. Dad held the grass back with one hand and carefully walked down on a diagonal, then turned around and held his other hand out to me. I took it and followed with the same practiced caution. Down by the water's edge, we tramp, trample out a small ledge and set down our buckets. I imitated Dad who was mutely inspecting the water, following his eyes, imagining I saw what he saw. There was, of course, no way of knowing whether this was a good spot. The water was dark 
and here and there stands of reeds stuck out of it, waving menacingly. But everything below the surface was hidden from us. We had no way of knowing, but we choose to have faith, as from time to time a person must. Fishing is often about exactly that. Thank you very much. Um, that leads on, particularly from the last sentence you just read out, that it does take a degree of faith, uh, which leads me to a question regarding the title of your book, which is The Gospel of the Eels, das Evangelium der Aale. And it is actually uh, explained, that choice of title is explained in a crucial chapter, not a very long chapter, but a crucial chapter, which is entitled Becoming a Fool. Mm. And it relates to the Christian beliefs of your dying grandmother and uh, of your take on mystery. Mystery is something that um, you as someone believing in something that is ver verifiable and someone who prefers science over religion, can mm. the rational over the transcendental, but you can still deal, and that's probably what the eel has, has taught you, you can still deal with mystery and you can see a value in miracles. Um, I might quote a memorable line at the end uh, where you write, you don't have to believe in miracles to believe in the meaning of a miracle. There are many ways to be a fool and you don't have to believe in the gospel or the eel in a literal sense, to believe what is at heart of their message. Those who die stay with us in some form. Can you say a few words about this crucial chapter, Becoming a Fool? Well, <clears throat> I, I won't, won't um, reveal the, the end of the book, but um, my father, who I have fished for eels with during my whole childhood at, and uh, have this connection through the eel with, uh, he be became sick and he and, uh, died of uh, cancer uh, in 2008. And, uh, and uh, something happened just, uh, just after the funeral. And uh, I won't uh, uh, reveal exactly what happened because it's on the la last page of the book, but something happened uh, uh, and it really happened uh, that way and and there was an eel involved and this thing that happened it actually affected me a lot and it, it uh, really fought me i learned that uh, that uh, in a way that my father would would be with me in some way even, even after he was gone and I don't think I would have written this book if, in, if that didn't have happened. Uh, and it would certainly not be called the Gospel of the Eels because I'm not a, I'm not a person of faith myself and I, I've never been. And I like to think that I have a, a, a scientific mindset, but I know I'm not... Um, I'm no stranger to mystery. I don't, I don't like to talk about belief, fact on one hand and belief on the other hand, but, but I think you can talk about fact and mysteries and they are connected and there's no difference. Uh, there doesn't have to be a big difference between them. Um, but when I, when I, I myself as a person uh, of n not of faith, when I read the, the, Bible and the um, Gospels in the Bible, I can see that they also are about something more simply simple. Maybe but for me, they also uh, they're also about how do you deal with death? How do you how do you accept death? And how do you uh, actually um, deal with loss and, and sorrow? And uh, when I read, like, uh, when Paul is uh, writing to the Corinthians and he said that um, uh, death, is not, uh, death is not the end, death is just uh, 
change and we we will all change and when jesus um, leaves the the his um, apostles he, he he tells them that i will be with you for all time and i could without without believing in the resurrection or eternal life i can i can still understand and believe in the fact that people dying and leaving us are going to be with us in some way and and uh, that is true about my father and and uh, in writing this book i also of course in a way are trying to to um, uh, write him to life or write him write him to eternal life and and, and uh, it's a way of uh, having him uh, with me even after he's gone um, so that's why it, I call the, the book the gospel of the eels because it's the gospel both of the, the eels and also um, of my father, very personal gospel in that way. Thank you very much, Patrick. But we're not dealing with loss and death as humans. Or we are also facing a world without the eel as the eel is an endangered species. Um, there's lots of factors uh, to which you allude in your book. They include pollution and illnesses, in, particularly, in particular, a nasty virus in these days. But there's also physical uh, obstacles on the way of eel migration, both upstream and downstream. Um, uh, dams, locks, and of course, of course, the turbines of hydroelectric plants. Um, now, only a fraction of the glass eels arriving at the coastal waters of Europe actually make it up these rivers. Um, I've just read recently that the, the Berlin City Council, along with the Brandenburg authorities, have purchased two million glass eel from the Spanish coast uh, in order to put them in the uh, river systems and lakes up here because eel is a delicacy, um, silver eel is a delicacy around just where we are in Potsdam. Uh, but that can't be the solution for all times to actually help the eel across uh, these obstacles. Uh, so. There's, of course, overfishing, and there's there are still people who regard the glass eel as a culinary uh, treat. But interesting enough, you in your book also point to cultural and political factors that the eel is actually something that shapes human identities in certain societies, that the Basques will not stop catching glass eel because that is part of their um, distinctive identity which they are ready to defend and similarly in Northern Ireland. Can you say a few words about these many folded uh, challenges the poor eel faces now and what we can do to help them? Yes, yeah. first of all, it, it, I think it's important to, to understand just, just how serious the situation is. The, the eel has been very popular all over Europe for a long time, but um, when, when um, the science today tried to calculate the, the, uh, the species, how many eels are there actually left, they, they uh, have come to the conclusion that the population has gone down with between 95 and 99 percent since the 70s. It's very, very dr dr dramatical. And that makes the eel, uh, it's listed as uh, critically endangered. That's the, that's the most serious category. And it could, could, could be uh, actually extinct uh, in, in, um, in our lifetime. And uh, so this is the eel question of today. This is the big eel question for uh, scientists today. Why is the eel disappearing? And, and we know a lot uh, about this. We know um, uh, that it has, there are several reasons. It's because of pollution, as you said. It's beca because of the water power plants. It's a big problem for the eel migration. 
and fishing, of course, and also the climate change in itself, because the if the climate changes in the oceans, the ocean currents uh, are affected, and maybe that uh, are affecting the eels uh, migrating too. But we don't really know what is the biggest problem. And that, there's where the politics come in, because as you said, in, in uh, the Basques and uh, also in uh, Ireland and uh, uh, very much in Sweden, in the southern, southern part of Sweden where I'm, uh, where I'm coming from, the eel fishing and eel eating has become a very important tradition. And uh, it's, it's a cultural history of this place where it has been very important for the identity, as you said. So that's when, when uh, we, if we are going to try to stop the eel fishing, we could put a total ban on eel fishing in all of uh, Europe. Then these people say, well, but, well but then we are also gonna lose a, a, a very important cultural history and a tradition and an identity. And that's what's uh, at stake here. So it's, this is a very difficult question to solve, of course, but the, the science is uh, pretty clear that to be able to save the eel, we have to understand it more. And that's where this dilemma comes in, that if we want to save the eel, we have to let go of the mystery. The mystery must go and we must solve these last eel questions and, and uh, uh, illuminate it totally in, in order to be able to save it. Thank you very, very much, Patrick. This was a most enlightening conversation we had. Um, I'm sure that many people will now be rushing to learn more about the eel. And I do sincerely hope that there are ways and means to be found to save the eel for another generation at the very least, so, so that it wouldn't be in our lifetimes that we see it disappear. And thank you very much for your wonderful words. And I hope to see you soon um, with a new project, which you alluded to, but not gave away what it is. Thank you very much, Patrick Swenson, and thanks to all of you who listened in. Um, we will be back with the Einstein Forum in early, mid-April. Uh, look out for more on this channel. Thank you very much. And um, bye-bye. Bye-bye, Patrick. Thank Thanks you very again. much for having me. Thank you.